is the growing isolation of WikiLeaks the start of the end for the online secret site? What right do companies like MasterCard and PayPal have to refuse to do business with it? And with the enemies massing at the gates, who can WikiLeaks call on to stay afloat financially? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. David Foster with you here. Any way it can, the Goliath that is the US government is bringing its full weight down on WikiLeaks. It's operating illegally in the US, says the State Department, demanding a shutdown of all accounts, transfers or deposits to the controversial website. So what do you do when a big corporate name such as Visa casts you adrift? Is the cyber backlash by WikiLeaks fans going to be enough? We well, you know the saying, a week is a long time in politics. It also seems to apply to WikiLeaks finances. In just seven days, supporters were prevented from having access and making donations, to some extent cutting off the site's lifeline. Trouble began on December the 1st, when Amazon, which hosted WikiLeaks servers in the United States, cut off ties. Amazon argues it's because WikiLeaks breached a contract, not because of political pressure. The online payment company PayPal was next. It stopped members from making donations. PayPal's vice president says the firm had been contacted by the US State Department. MasterCard and Visa Europe followed suit and started suspending the use of their cards on WikiLeaks. But payments can still be made through this company, Flutter. The joint British-Swedish firm says it's seen no evidence in those two countries that WikiLeaks is doing anything illegal. Joining us now to discuss this issue, our guests here in Doha, Mark Faha, visiting professor at the School of Foreign Service of Georgetown University. In Birmingham, in Middle England, Jonathan Hemus, founder and director of Insignia, a PR firm specialising in crisis communications. And via broadband from Basel in Switzerland, Andreas Fink, chief executive of Datacell. Good to have all three of you on the programme. Uh, Andres, let me start with you first of all and, and try and summarise what uh, Datacell does. It provides servers and it stores credit card information for WikiLeaks. At least you did until what happened on December the 7th. Tell us what that was. Well, uh, Datacell, first and all, is, uh, is a data centre company and uh, one of our services is to provide payment services uh, for our customers. And uh, as such, we provide a uh, payment service uh, to WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. So if people pay via uh, Visa or MasterCard, we charge the card and give the money to WikiLeaks. That's our job. And on 7th uh, of December, we got a notice from um, our payment backend processor saying that Visa has instructed them um, uh, to suspend us for seven days so they can complete the due diligence um, if uh, the payments to WikiLeaks is not going to hurt their brand uh, or uh, you know hurt them financially in some way. But it also said, because you sent us the email, Andres, it also said that that seven-day suspension could continue indefinitely. Yeah, that's true. So you went out and spoke to other credit card companies besides MasterCard and Visa, and they said to you, yeah, we've had contact with the State Department on this issue too. Yeah, I contacted another credit card company, a smaller one, uh, who indirectly then confirmed that uh, they cannot uh, accept payments uh, for WikiLeaks because the uh, US uh, government has intervened. You don't think it was simply because of this, quote, due diligence. You do seriously think there was political pressure put on these companies? Well, it's very simple. We have been doing uh, donations uh, for WikiLeaks since uh, almost two months. Uh, we started in October. And, uh, you know, out of a sudden, uh, uh, the donations increased because of the big press releases and because PayPal is closing down. And then uh, out of a sudden, uh, I get to know that uh, Visa and MasterCard are no longer uh, allowing donations to WikiLeaks over the press. I mean, they didn't approach us saying anything is wrong. And um, for us, it's a very clear case. Uh, WikiLeaks is not illegal in any way, in, in, in our way. So um, it shouldn't be illegal for us to process uh, donations. 
and the donations come from all over the world from from really from every kind of individual so it's to me it's it's, it's very clear that uh, visa and the mastercard are just uh, doing what their government is telling them to do but they're not telling us the truth because uh, they're afraid that we going after them which we really do want to do thanks andreas uh, stay with us of course we're going to turn to mark faho who's with us here in doha visiting professor of government uh, at georgetown university uh, on a spell here in Qatar. do you do you think there's any doubt that the u.s government is arm twisting here well, no, on the face of it, I think it's clear. Yes, there is a witch hunt going on against w WikiLeaks. But the question I would like to pose is, the, is related to the broader picture. I mean, what are we getting here? The quantity of WikiLeaks data is impressive, but the quality is not. Uh, we've discovered precious few new items uh, through WikiLeaks. And in exchange, what we're getting is this global crackdown on uh, WikiLeaks in particular, but in general, a threat sort of to the three freedom of the, the Internet. So I think the pre repercussions of this whole affair are, show uh, some ominous signs. Uh, is the U.S. government doing this then not because it's worried about the material that's out there, but because it wants to, to prove a point that it can uh, quash any kind of dissent if it chooses to do so? I would think so, given, I mean, at least to set a precedent. And uh, bear in mind that there have been uh, I, uh, ideas paneled in the U.S., most particularly by Joseph Lieberman, to enable the president, in fact, to have a red button to shut down the Internet as a whole. So, and if we take the Patriot Act, for instance, as a precedent, we also see that civil liberties were curtailed there, unsuspectively so. So, in wake of this war on terror, which is, of course, to a large degree, legitimate war on terror, we should be on guard that our civil liberties are not curtailed. Uh, in essence, uh, suppose this is about the high price you can end up paying for free speech. For almost 50 years, America has had a Freedom of Information Act, and that gives people a right to ask for secret government information. The words used by the U.S. leader in 1966, well, they show a very different attitude then compared to today. Former President Lyndon Johnson said, this legislation springs from one of our most successful principles. Democracy works best when people have access to all information that the security of the nation permits. No one should be able to pull curtains of secrecy around decisions which can be revealed without injury to the public interest. So back to you, Mark, on this one. Uh, is the information that's out there in any sense a danger to national security? So far, no. It's been a danger to regional peace and stability because it's raised tensions between Sunni and Shia and between the factions of Lebanon, for instance. But Lyndon Johnson is a poor choice to sort of a poor poster child for transparency. He was known for his backroom deals. JFK has a similar quote saying that secrecy is repugnant to a free society, and I trust him more in that regard. Obama, one should add, has rejected more Freedom of Information Act requests than even Bush did in his entire tenure. So even though Obama claimed that he would create the most transparent administration, administration in history, in point of fact, he has betrayed that promise. When they take a look at the Act closely, the Freedom of Information Act, it has some exemptions. I'm going to read one out now. I want to know whether you think these documents in any way fall into this category. Uh, there are nine exemptions. Number one, uh, properly classified documents in the interests of national defence or foreign policy need not be divulged in that category or not no these are not top secret documents right uh, so uh, very as i said before 95 percent is if you want to call it diplomatic trivia i mean uh, almost a sort of adolescent puerile uh, conversations between low-level diplomats no names are mentioned that we didn't know before uh, no real secrets revealed um, so it only by and large is information which already was to a large degree in the public sphere uh, it just makes it more explicit, and as I said before, by uh, officially attributing the statements we all knew, for instance, what certain Gulf leaders said, it raises the tension and uh, creates, creates, in this, this regard, embarrassment, not so much for the U.S., I would dare say, but for the regional uh, leaders and uh, situations. So. Uh, Julian Assange's Swiss bank account, which was run by the, the Swiss post office, that was right. also shut down. Some suggestion that that had nothing to do with political pressure. What's your feeling on that one, that it might just be Swiss laws that he's not allowed to have an account? 
Yeah, I believe that is correct, technically speaking. But legally speaking, he was not a resident of Switzerland. I'm a Swiss citizen, and I have friends uh, there who have told me this in the in the sphere, in the legal sphere, that he was not a Swiss citizen, and you're not allowed to have a post account if you're not a citizen of Switzerland or res resident of Switzerland. So, but that does not uh, sort of gainsay the fact that yes, there has been a witch hunt, at least on the face of it, against Julian Assange. Okay. Go to the UK. Talk to uh, Jonathan Hemus now, Chief Executive of Insignia. Uh, Jonathan, one of your jobs is sitting down with people who are in a spot of bother uh, and saying this is how you sort these things out for yourselves. What do you think was going through the minds of the, the Chief Executives of MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, all of these people who've suddenly gone, look, we don't want to know you, WikiLeaks. What would they have been thinking? What was their reasoning for doing this? Well, clearly, a uh, corporate reputation takes years to build up, but in a crisis uh, like this, it can be destroyed very, very quickly. And I think uh, the people running the organizations we're talking about, the MasterCards, the, the Visas, the, the PayPals, they're wrestling uh, with a real challenge. Uh, do we bow to pressure if indeed there is pressure and cut off funding to, to WikiLeaks? Um, or do we protect uh, free speech um, and leave that, leave that funding in place? And what they're trying to uh, make their minds up about is what is going to be in the best long-term reputational interest of the organization concerned. And I think that very much depends on the individual uh, values that underlie those organizations and the relative importance of the stakeholders with whom they are, they are dealing. Frankly, from a, from a reputational point of view alone, I think maybe some of the more um, contemporary internet organizations like PayPal and like Amazon are maybe more vulnerable in reputational terms because they are very modern, contemporary organizations who've made a lot of money and built their business on the freedom and the speed of the internet. So for them to be doing something which may be perceived as going against that could actually be more damaging to their reputation than those that are maybe the more establishment organizations. But is it also equally possible that by ditching WikiLeaks, which has a, a pretty big worldwide following, they could be also damaging their reputation and certain people will say, look, I'm not going to use them anymore? Absolutely. I think this is uh, a big call for those organizations. And uh, as I said, there's a, there's a tension here that if they, if they do cut off the funding, then exactly uh, what you say may happen. They can be seen to be stifling freedom of speech and suffer the backlash. If they don't, uh, they can be seen by, by government and, and, and others to be uh, helping to fund an organization which poses a security risk, potentially. Um, and making that judgment call, I guess, is what senior management is, is, is there to do ultimately. Um, but as I say, I think the key thing is the organization needs to act according to its own values and principles. Yes, bear in mind the influence and the persuasion and the impact on all of the various stakeholders that the organization comes into contact with, but it then must do what is right according to its own values and principles. I think, though, one of the things that may potentially have been underestimated is that, historically, government was a very, very powerful influencer. Today, with the spread of social media, uh, as we've seen during this incident, uh, consumer power is so much stronger, so much more vocal than ever before, that perhaps the power of government, the overriding power of government, is not quite such a big influencer as it was a number of years back. I'm going to come back to you in just a moment, Jonathan, because I want to ask you what advice you might give uh, WikiLeaks itself. Uh, but let's bring back in Andreas Fink, who's uh, been listening to this conversation from Basel in Switzerland. Uh, is it possible for you at the moment at all to do any business for WikiLeaks? No, we are just uh, doing the, the credit card transactions for WikiLeaks, and that uh, has been shut down by Visa and MasterCard, and uh, you know uh, all the donations are basically impossible to do at this moment. But it is possible to to get money to them in other ways, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I mean uh, we're not involved in that part, but there are uh, the possibility of doing wire transfers or send physical cash. 
but it's clear that uh, most users, especially uh, if they are from the United States, uh, they are much more used to using credit cards. And if you send physical cash, there, there's a, a risk uh, that it can get lost. Uh, if you do a wire transfer, you might face quite high uh, transfer costs. So you know, to get to donate, if you want to donate 10 euros. Uh, it might cost you twenty dollars to do this, so it, it becomes quite ridiculous. Yeah, and in, and indeed, a lot of the donations are are of the smaller kind. Uh, let me ask you one other thing: when it comes to WikiLeaks itself and dealing with WikiLeaks, has this hurt or enhanced your company's reputation? That's a good question. Um, in, in one way, it has hurt us, of course, because um, uh, we cannot do business right now with Visa and MasterCard, and uh, you know they basically own the credit card market. I don't know how big, but I assume like 90% of the credit card transactions of the world go through those two companies. So in that way, it hurts. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, it gave us some some um, interesting feedback from people. We get a lot of feedback. Uh, that people um, would, uh, you know, hold us up for for standing up and uh, against um, those big forces, because uh, everybody else seems to be afraid from the U.S. government, and we're not. We, I mean, we have laws in Switzerland and we have laws in Iceland, which protect uh, those kind of things. And uh, what scares me most, actually, is that the U.S. government is able to put pressure on those companies. And they don't even question that. I mean, we have laws. If, if, if somebody comes to me in Switzerland and they say, I have to close down my business because of whatever, then the answer would be, well, get an injunction from, from a judge. And so you know, if the judge says it's illegal, then it's easy. Yeah, but let's put that point to, to Mark Faha. Uh, looking at this from uh, the government's point of view, how much leverage would they have had over companies like Amazon, uh, PayPal, MasterCard, all, and all of those who have now said to, to WikiLeaks, we don't want to touch you at the moment? Uh, I think, again, judging from the uh, aftermath of 9-11, quite a bit. I remember then that pressure was put, for instance, on Swiss banks at that point to reveal accounts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that was done promptly. So, yes, I think they have leverage. And in the longer term, do you think these companies are, are going to kowtow uh, to the U.S. government ad infinitum? Well, you have to ask that. I, I can't speak for Visa and MasterCard, to be honest, so I can't tell you that. But, you know, what you know, do you think, not only as, as a professor but also as an American citizen, ab about the way that the U.S. government is approaching this? Is it making it a bigger problem, perhaps, for itself uh, than it need to have been, or is there something uh, darker behind all of this? Well, yeah, I have my suspicions about the whole affair, even about Julian Assange, to be frank, because he comes from a murky background. He was affiliated with intelligence agencies. And uh, we have, for, for instance, uh, President Obama last year appointed somebody called Cass Sunstein as the, uh, the, office, uh, the head of the Office of Information. And uh, this reminds me of sort of the ministries of information we used to have here in the Arab world and elsewhere in Soviet countries. And one of his premises was that the government should infiltrate social networking sites, should plant false conspiracy theories, should uh, raise sort of false... Uh, uh, you know, have these false flag operations of sorts, psych op operations, etc. So if you read his paper, which he wrote at Harvard on this issue, uh, you will find that a lot of it rings eerily familiar to what is going on today. You're going to have to help me a little bit here because I'm not quite sure I would, if I was uh, in charge of the U.S. government, I'd want to see a lot of that stuff out there, whether it's dangerous uh, in against the interests of national security or, or simply embarrassing. Why would they want it to get but out? But how much of it has, in fact, been embarrassing to the U.S. government and how much of it has been embarrassing to, again, I repeat, Arab leaders or uh, China? I mean, we knew China was spying on Google. We knew a lot of Arab leaders had suspicions about Iran, etc. We knew about Putin. We knew about Berlusconi. A lot of this is trivia. And all it really does, if you drop the balance sheet at the end, in my view, is to, it doesn't really embarrass the U.S. government. There are no real state secrets revealed. Nobody's going to be held accountable uh, in Washington. At best, it could serve the interest of those who are, for instance, agitating within the CIA or the government for a war against Iran, for, you know, putting more pressure on China, etc. These agendas are served by WikiLeaks thus far. 
uh, I don't see much in the ways of sort of leading to real change in Washington. And let's go to the UK, back to Birmingham. Uh, Jonathan Hemus there. I suggested that uh, give you a couple of minutes to think about how you might advise WikiLeaks itself on, on sorting out its problems. But in a sense, I mean, the, the oxygen of publicity uh, has been fantastic for it. Uh, do you think it needs any help? Well, I was going to make exactly that point. I think uh, one of the things that WikiLeaks probably doesn't need is uh, advice on public relations. It's done a fantastic job of getting this um, story ac across. And interestingly, it's done that both via conventional media, but also very much uh, driven by social and online media as well. And it's done one of the things that all good uh, PR campaigns do it has utilized the influence of third parties to carry its message for it to the extent now that a lot of this story is being driven by third parties rather than by WikiLeaks itself. So purely from a PR point of view, it's done a superb job in getting this story across. What do you make of Mark Farhar's suggestion that uh, all of this could have been put out there on purpose by the US government? Frankly, it's something that I wouldn't have any, any particular knowledge of. Uh, I think from, um, from the point of view of the uh, organizations that we're discussing now, the MasterCards and, and the Visas and the PayPals, I bet they wished it hadn't been put out there because it has given them an enormous uh, crisis management challenge that maybe they couldn't have anticipated. Good crisis communication is often about the planning and preparing for it. Um, this is potentially a situation that they hadn't planned or prepared for. And of course there's a second crisis for them as well, which is the bringing down of their websites or the uh, difficulty that people are having um, to, to, to pay for goods using, using their services, which is a secondary crisis. People are now asking how robust uh, are their systems and how secure is my information. So they actually have a, a double crisis to deal with. Uh, Back to Basel and Andreas Fink. I mean, you're at the sharp end of this. Uh, you're waiting to find out if, in fact, uh, Visa, MasterCard uh, will start to do business through you with WikiLeaks once again. But I want to ask you about, about the, the physical amount of money that uh, was coming through your system. I don't want you to give me com confidential information, but did you see the amount, the number of donations go up pretty rapidly uh, once WikiLeaks got all these headlines? Well, uh, this is clear, you know, the more uh, people know about WikiLeaks, uh, the more donations you're going to get. Uh, because, uh, you know, people who don't know about WikiLeaks, they cannot donate. And the second effect uh, which we have seen is when PayPal was cut down, that the uh, amount has jumped up, which means that uh, a lot of people were donating over PayPal before because, uh, you know, Internet users or frequent Internet users who understand uh, the freedom of speech issues in the internet and who understand what WikiLeaks does uh, are the ones who are going to donate uh, most likely and uh, they all used PayPal and when PayPal was gone uh, our uh, volumes have increased. Just a um, quick thought from you before we have to go Andreas, do you think in a few days time uh, Visa and MasterCard are going to come back to you and say yep okay we'll carry on doing business with WikiLeaks we think you're in the clear or is that it do you think um well actually we don't know i mean we had uh, the due diligence process being completed the last few days uh, by uh, the the payment processor and they go back to to visa and then it's a decision visa has to take thank you very much indeed uh, we look forward to hearing from you andres tell us whether in fact you got the business back online uh, with WikiLeaks. Our thanks also to our other guests. Doha, Mark Faha in Birmingham, Jonathan Hemus, and as we saw via broadband from Basel in Switzerland, Andreas Fink. Thank you too for watching this edition of Inside Story. Drop us a line. If you like, email us at aljazeera.net, preceded by Inside Story. Inside Story at aljazeera.net. From me, David Foster. Goodbye for now.